Good evening and welcome to Colorado Decides, a joint production of Colorado Public Television, CBS4, KOA News Radio, and the Colorado Sun. I'm your host, Dominic Dizzuti. Thank you very much for joining us. Joining me is political analyst Eric Sonderman. Tonight, we continue our general election season looking at the major amendments and initiatives on November's ballot. This debate will examine the proposed Amendment 74, which if passed would mandate that Colorado property owners are compensated for lost value of property, property value if regulations are passed which would limit their use. Joining us for the next 30 minutes are, in support of Amendment 74, Mark Arnush, a, farm, a farmer in Prospect Valley. Here against the measure, Sam Mamet, Executive Director of the Colorado Municipal League. Gentlemen, thank you both for joining us. This should Thanks be a, a, a fun yeah, half hour. Thanks for having us. Uh, Mark, let me just start very basic. Uh, what, in a nutshell, uh, beyond what I've, I stumbled to get through, would Amendment 74 do if passed? Well, what it really does is it allows individuals that have been affected negatively by a rule or regulation passed by government to seek the compensation for their property value. We already see in, in our Constitution what's there in terms of condemnation, and we, we know how to assess that when there's an actual physical taking of the land. But for the very first time in Colorado, the voters have a chance to, to decide whether or not they should seek fair market value of that pr private property right. And Sam, what's the, uh, I guess, bumper sticker version of the problems with this amendment? Uh, interestingly enough, this is not a debate about property rights. It's a debate about clarity and in the case of 74, the lack of it. Uh, the amendment, to be specific about it, says that any government regulation or law which reduces the fair market value of private property is subject to just compensation. I know what it says, but I have no clue what it means. Well, let's get to it. Let's see if we can answer that question right now. Eric, let's start us off with some questions well, for our panelists. We have a half hour, so we'll drill down as we go, but let me keep it a little bit on a high level here. I'll start with you, Sam. On, uh, on that high level, I know your intro said you have no idea what it means, but conceptually, do you have a problem with this? If the government comes in in a regulatory way or, a, a, or through statute and decreases, the effect of that is decrease the value of your property or my property, why shouldn't there be compensation? That's a great question. Uh, and there already is that protection in place in our existing state constitution. Our existing state constitution, which dates back to 1876, actually covers this issue both in terms of when a government action, the state or local government, uh, takes property or damages property, which interestingly enough extends beyond the federal protection under the Fifth Amendment. This goes much further in terms of uh, that issue, and we have ample authority in state law now uh, to protect property owners against those kinds of actions. I don't want to get into the weeds and turn this into a law school class. Uh, that wouldn't be uh, productive. But uh, the point is, fundamentally, when words get put in the state constitution, however well intended, and our uh, issues are not with the farming and agriculture community, there's a strong relationship that we have between cities and farmers that's extremely important. But words matter when you put them in the state constitution. And fundamentally, Eric, this will have to go up to the Colorado Supreme Court to be litigated and resolved. It's going to affect just about every local government decision that's taken. And Mark, let me just turn to you and give you a, a chance here. But, you know, when I read this ballot title, it sounds as good as any ballot title I've read in a while. And the superficial appeal has to be, what's wrong with that? Sam's basic message is there are consequences both intended and unintended. Do you agree that there are potentially unintended consequences here? Well, I, I think when we really look at the, battle the, the ballot title, it basically does what we wanted it to do. It says, look, when there's a rule or regulation that comes into place that changes the fair market value, and that's the substantive difference between what Sam is talking about and what this ballot title does, when there's a change in the value of the property, they're, they're, those words do matter, and that's why I think it's so important that the voters get to decide this come fall. You know, he talked about, well, it's already in the Constitution that w there's a takings provision there, but that's when the physical value, the physical property itself is taken. Maybe a road is built upon my farm, or maybe somebody's setback is pushed back into their, their front yard for public good. We understand that. But what happens when a farmer like me has 10 acres 
and through a rule or a regulation, the value of my property is diminished by nine and a half acres. Do I not get a, a just compensation mechanism there for me to at least try in the court system? Absolutely. And um, I agree with Mark, uh, but the problem is I agree with him only about half because you can interpret this about any way you want to. He may be half right. The problem is, under the language in this amendment, uh, we don't know what it means exactly. This is the broadest proposal of any state measure across the country. Now, from a property rights advocate position, that may be a good thing. But when the lawsuits start piling up, that's not going to be a good thing for the taxpayers. I just don't think those lawsuits are going to pile up, and here's why. The, we're not changing the, 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 the sideboards of the Constitution that makes, makes this standard very high in, in terms of it presenting before a court. If there's a taking, and, it, and if that taking has to do with value, they have to be able to demonstrate that in a court of law. That has to be something that is for sure because the costs of litigation are so great, I just don't know that anybody wants to go to that measure and not make sure that they're right. I, I think this, this ballot title does a lot of things, and, and why it's so broad is because from time to time, governments overreach. And when they do overreach, we need to make sure that the courts can look at that as the guiding principle that the Constitution is to make sure that private interests are protected. Gentlemen, let me jump in here because I think I also want to take it to the level of the reality of politics. I think I adore the civil discussion we're having about property rights and the role of government and everything else. But this is also Colorado. This is also 2018 where Proposition 112 is on the ballot and it's all about uh, mineral rights uh, at risk uh, between oil and gas and what could happen if a law is passed that would restrict the use of those oil, uh, those mineral rights. If there was no problem or no risk to oil and gas mineral rights in Colorado. Would this amendment exist? Mark, we'll start with you. Yes, I do. I, I think it would actually exist. And, and the reason why, it's all about managing natural resources. That's oil and gas. But it's, for me, on my farm, it's the land. It's the water. It's the ability to grow a crop and help feed the state and certainly feed the country. You know, the Colorado Farm Bureau is just about to embark on its 100th year, and we have a policy book that kind of is the guiding principles of what we stand for as an organization. And in that policy book, a very long time ago, it talked about if the government takes the value of your property, we recommend that you, we have the avenue to seek just compensation. Right. This would have been brought forward whether or not 112 made it on the ballot or not, because it's important to, to landowners, to farmers and ranchers, and certainly homeowners, that we protect the, the interest of private property. Could the Farm Bureau afford to bring this forward without the support of oil and gas companies? Well, the support of the oil and gas companies certainly helped. But yes, I, I, I believe that the Farm Bureau would have easily been able to carry this ballot initiative. Sam, let's get to the effect of oil and gas within this amendment, proposed amendment. Well, sadly, this amendment's been drafted by some out-of-state corporate interests, primarily some out of the oil and gas sector, that have some old scores they want to settle with uh, some local governments they feel that have overreached in regulating their industry. And I don't think the Colorado Constitution ought to be their personal playground. To settle those old scores, that's what this amendment at its core is really all about. And if it were about private property rights and the protection of private property rights, and by the way, we oppose number 112 for that very reason and join with the Farm Bureau in opposition to 112 because that is an attack on private property rights, among other things. But if, but if 74 truly were to protect private property rights, why are groups like Club 20, the Colorado Association of Realtors, the Jefferson County Economic Development Corporation, to name but a few, in opposition to uh, the measure? The Colorado Association of Realtors has a 22-page legal memo that just eviscerates the amendment. Uh, that's a concern. Uh, Eric, let's get you back in both. Well, state is following on Dominic, staying with the subject. I'll start with Sam. If there is, a, I don't know anything other than what we discussed off air about Mark's farm, but so it's not Mark. It can be any farmer, any rancher, any property owner who has mineral rights. Yes. And those mineral rights 
that, that rancher is relying on those mineral rights to fund his or her retirement. Those mineral rights, let's say as a consequence of 112, are all of a sudden essentially diminished or wow. eradicated. Why isn't that rancher deserved some compensation? Absolutely, that's one of the fundamental problems with number 112. The problem with 74 and 112 is focused on the particular aspect of oil and gas and the production of it and how it occurs under the setback concept. We don't have any disagreement about that. The problem that we disagree on with 74 is that it goes far beyond just that issue. But I do feel that 74 is detrimental to the oil and gas industry, and I've shared this with representatives of the industry. I think it implicates any conflict. I think it exacerbates, increases any conflict between surface rights and mineral rights. This thing is going to become the preferred legal weapon of choice for every property owner to sue every other property owner well, when they just, have a disagreement. Let me just drill down a tiny bit here and then we'll let Mark in. Sure. I know you guys are united in opposing 112, but right. for the sake of this discussion, let's assume 112 passes. Then that rancher whose, whose mineral rights are eradicated essentially, I think the difference between the two of you then is whether that farmer rancher gets compensation. Well, uh, if Again, I, I, it's, it's hard to distinguish these things, which is always part of the problem in this, uh, in this debate around ballot measures. If uh, Proposition 112 passes, um, that is a real problem that could occur. My point is Amendment 74 goes even farther than that. We could talk about water rights, for example, and I've had some water lawyers around the state who are concerned about what does this do in terms of conflicts between junior rights and senior rights and things like the doctrine of prior appropriation. Remember, this is not a statute, it's in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. So words matter. The Supreme Court's going to have to sort this out. By the way, there's no ability for the legislature under this amendment to implement the measure as there has been in other measures in other states. And Mark, I'll let you in, but maybe you could address Sam's point of why you chose to do this through the Constitution instead of through statute. That's the best place for it. You know, I'll, I'll read you what is currently in the Colorado Constitution right now. It says, private property shall not be taken or damaged for public or private use without just compensation. What this major simply does is add just a few simple words. We would like to add or reduced in fair market value by government law or regulation. And I think that's where Sam is, is maybe missing the point here. He talked about a surface owner and a subsurface owner suing each other. That's not what we're going for. It's through government interaction. It's through government law or regulation. That, that's the substantive difference here. This isn't about neighbor suing neighbor. This is about a rule or regulation that's put into place by a, a governmental entity, town, municipal, uh, county, state, or other, that changes the fair market value of that property. It's not between Sam and I, it's between the government and the private entity. Mark, where, where's the limitation, I guess? Because if, when I hear something that <clears throat> when a government law or regulation reduces the fair market value of the property, that seems extraordinarily broad. There's a lot of government laws. There's local laws and state laws and federal laws. And there's a lot of different yeah. implications of what fair market value is. I, I took a couple of economics courses. I know establishing that is not uh, a piece of cake. So I don't see where, I don't see where the limitations are in this amendment once it's passed, where a farmer, we, we've gotten to know you before the debate started. We, we know you're a, uh, was it now a third generation farmer in Colorado. I don't think any other Colorado voters out there are wanting to take any rights away from you, but not all uh, landowners and properties out there are third generation farmers like yourself that I think would be able to take advantage of this. What, what's in here to stop someone taking advantage of this law? Well, there's a number of things. One of the things that we're not touching within the language of this ballot question is a lot of the sideboards that are up against what the courts will and will not. So what do you mean by that? Well, there, there's a number of things. Well, you know, is there a shared public interest here? If there's a shared public interest, that's not a takings. You know, if it's, it has to do with health or safety of the environment, 
that's not a takings. This is a direct action towards an individual, and because the courts would have that before them, because of the broad nature, they would have to make sure that that fits within the confines of those things that already exist in, in the Constitution. But to, to answer your question directly, that's up for the courts to decide. We need it broad enough so that it includes a lot of those things that we can't think of right now when putting together a ballot measure that may come down the road some other day. Would, would this qualify? If you're a farmer, you farm wheat, and I, I don't know farming, farm biology, so I'm going to sound fairly ignorant here, but if you can grow a certain wheat that let's say is uh, resistant to Roundup, and the Colorado State Legislature passes a law where no longer can, uh, Roundup can no longer be used in the state of Colorado, do they just take away fair market value from your land, from your property, because you've been growing wheat that is Roundup resistant? Well, I'll answer your hypothetical question with a hypothetical answer. It depends. It depends on the okay. case that the individual can bring before the courts. Okay. There's a lot more details that go into that whole scenario that would be demonstrable, demonstrable before the courts. Okay. And so the true answer to that is it just depends. Sam, your answer. Well, Mark, with all due respect, uh, I work with city and town leaders across the state, from the biggest cities to the smallest towns. And the most important catchphrase they're going to hear moving forward should Amendment 74 pass is may it please the court because we're going to spend a lot of time in court litigating it depends he may be half right and that's precisely the problem we don't know uh, I'll just put this in a very simple agricultural context uh, we're a right to farm state that is to say we have a state law that allows counties and municipal governments to adopt ordinances to support the right to farm and agriculture in their communities. I know I helped to draft the legislation years ago. We have over three dozen counties and cities across the state that have adopted these kinds of ordinances or parts of their comp plan. And as a result of that, uh, farmer Joe and Jane Farmer approach uh, the town board, say, look, we want to expand our farming operation to put in a larger uh, dairy farm. And the town board says, absolutely, you've been great neighbors and great citizens in our community. We want to support that. But down the road, they approved a new residential development that has some deed-restricted housing in it for school teachers and cops and firefighters. And all of a sudden, that particular developer is not smelling the smell of money that that farmer is smelling. There's going to be a serious dispute under this language as to whether or not that rezoning of that farm affects the fair market value of that particular development. There's going to be a nasty little lawsuit. It will pit property owner against property owner, and the local government that made the decision will be the collateral damage, and that's the taxpayer, and that's expensive. But to, 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 that end, to that end, you, there, there was a whole lot in that story. But I think one of the things that Sam failed to tell you is that that dairy was permitted under that current zoning plan. If the residential area came in and rezoned to residential outside of that, that's a completely different issue altogether. There is no takings there at all. I'm hiring you as my attorney when we <laughs> argue that before the Supreme Court. That'll be the first case that goes up. Deal. Aaron. It'll never get to that point because the cost will be too great to hang your, your hopes and your promises on a, a case that has on shaky ground. Okay. This has to be on very solid ground for it to ever see the inside of a court. Well, I mean, Where let me just, let me just dig a little deeper and, uh, uh, for Mark. Since we're talking about lawsuits and litigation, get rid of this specific example you guys are going back and forth on, but how in the world, if this amendment were to be adopted into the Constitution, does it not become a playground for massive amounts of litigation, at least over the first many years, while the state sorts out exactly what it means? I can answer this simply by saying the courts are going to examine this very narrowly in terms of the takings provisions. It's like I talked about before. There's a very narrow interpretation of what is and what is not a taking. This has to be a direct action against a direct individual by a government entity. That's a huge bar to leap over before you ever walk inside a courtroom. There has to be economic damage. There has to be an investment-backed expectation by the landowner to seek that loss. It's not of, hey, this municipality passed a rule or regulation and I think I've lost the value of my farm. Uh-uh. You have to prove it. You have to prove it. You have to prove how you were damaged and what that market value looks like. 
That is an incredibly high bar to leap over. Well, Sam, obviously I'll give you a shot on this one, but let me specifically suggest you made reference at the beginning that the state already has laws with respect to takings, condemnation, et cetera. Is there room, short of Amendment 74, is there room to improve those current laws to adopt to adapt to situations right. such as mineral rights and others? That, that's a great question, Eric. That's a, that's a, a core question. You know, I said uh, to some of the proponents early on, including and most especially to our friends over at the Farm Bureau, that if there are indeed issues around property rights actions, actions taken by my members, our cities and towns, that are affecting the property rights and the interests of farmers and ranchers. I want to know about that and have a sit down and uh, discuss that. And I made that commitment. That commitment still stands. It, it just strikes me that this sort of came out of the blue and uh, without any kind of consultation or any kind of conversation. Of course, that's what the legislature is for. That's where we resolve these things. Um, that's why we have dialogues between uh, associations. Uh, and so, of course, uh, I want to have that kind of conversation. But we can't have that conversation now because at this point, the voters have to either say yes or no. There's no yellow light here, and that's the problem. Everything that Mark said, as I said earlier, he may well be half right, and that's a risk I don't want to see the taxpayers of this state and local communities have to take. Sam, let me ask you something about more of the campaign. Mark, we'll get you involved as, uh, as well. Um, doing uh, my research for this to see some of the uh, the websites that belong to opponents of this amendment, uh, saying, and I, hyperbole is the currency of election year, so I understand that, but if this is passed, strip clubs and bars will be next to schools. Where do claims like that come from? We've been talking about property rights and mineral rights and everything else. I, you, you want me to? Yes. I don't want to. Uh, that comes from some of our material, and I stand by it. Zoning of um, uh, what we call undesirable land uses, an adult entertainment business. Uh, you know, uh, in the process of resolving land use disputes, land use policies look at the greater good of a community. And if a decision is made on where a particular uh, strip club is to be located, and that business disagrees with that decision because they assert, rightly or wrongly, that that action, that decision, reduces their fair market value, it's going to wind up in the Supreme Court. And it's going to affect neighborhood integrity. Things like liquor licensing, licensing of marijuana establishments, all of these kinds of things go way beyond the issues that we're discussing now they implicate all kinds of decisions okay, that me, we make. Let me get uh, Mark involved here. Mark, it seems to me, from the outside looking in, that this, uh, this could be a product of the divide that is between urban and rural Colorado. It's been getting more and more stark over the years uh, so that laws can't be passed in Denver that affect ranchers out in Yuma. Um, what would you say to that kind of assertion? Uh, I think that's exactly right. I, I, Sometimes those in eastern Colorado and in the rural parts of the state feel like we're the forgotten part of Colorado. But I really like what Sam said is that we've got to start that dialogue between those competing interests of urban and rural divide here in the state. He's right. You know, municipalities are not out there to just hammer on the small guy. They're not out there to take that value away time and time again. But from time to time it happens. And when it does happen, there should be a pathway for that individual to seek fair compensation. It just doesn't make sense to me that a takings isn't a takings until 90% of the value of that property is diminished. We, we both can agree on that. But I, I think there's kind of a swing and a miss here in, in Sam's, I guess you'd call it maybe the sky is falling, uh, talk about the change in, in some of the different uh, uh, land use. Those, those land use issues can happen today regardless if Amendment 74 passes or not. All right. And gentlemen, I'm going to hold us right there because a half hour goes by very quickly around here. It's time for our closing statements. We offer each of our panelists a one-minute closing statement uh, to offer to you, the voters of Colorado. Uh, we flip a coin before the debate. Sam, you'll be our first one-minute closing statement uh, to finish the debate. Well, first of all, thanks for the invite. This is great. This is exactly the kind of conversation we need 
on these important issues. So I appreciate it, Dominic. Look, as I said earlier, this is not a debate about property rights. This is not a debate about farming and ranching. I'm not even sure it's a debate around oil and gas, even though certain sectors of that industry drafted this. This is a debate about clarity, and in this case, the lack of it. Words matter in the state constitution. The simplicity of this is only exceeded by its complexity, and the taxpayers are going to have to foot the bill to resolve what these words mean, and that's very bad public policy. Sam, thank you very much. Mark, it's turn, your turn for your one minute closing statement. Thank you for the time here today. You know, Colorado is a state that is known as one that can solve problems, and Amendment 74 does just that. It's a common sense approach to protect the fair market value of private property. You know, as I said before, it just doesn't make sense that a takings isn't a takings until 90% of the value is diminished. But who would stand by idly and watch a government rule or regulation take the value of their property? Well, no one. But there isn't a clear pathway where that individual can seek just compensation. Amendment 74 changes that. You know, government says that this is going to change the way that they operate in the future. But when it, when it comes to these kind of taking provisions, that's not good government. And that's not the way we should do business. Coloradoans deserve better. You know, at the end of the day, there's a lot that we can agree on and there's a lot that we can disagree on. But maintaining the value of private property should always be the pinnacle interest to all Coloradoans. It's the Colorado way of life. Mark, thank you very much. That is all the time we have for our debate. Looking at Amendment 74, I'd like to thank our issue representatives, Mark Arnish and Sam Mamet. I also thank my fellow panelists, Eric Sonderman, my co-pilot on all these debates. I greatly appreciate him being here. If you'd like to find out more information about any of this year's general election issues and races, please visit our websites. There's cpt12.org, cbsdenver.com, koanewsradio.com, and thecoloradosun.com. It's a big partnership. We Be sure to stay tuned as we continue our both sides of the story high school debate tournament. Tonight, students from Mountain Vista High School and Mount, uh, Manitou Springs High School debate if Colorado should invest in more water storage like dams and reservoirs. I think you'll be astonished to see what these high school students pull out as points about a very important, water's been an important issue in Colorado before Colorado was a state. So I hope you stay tuned by, uh, after you see a great debate like this, stay tuned for another great debate with some high school students right now following this debate. For everyone here at Colorado Public Television, I'm Dominic Dizzuti. Thank you very much for watching. Good night. Mm -hmm.